Okay, picking up where we left off on page 238, we're still talking about the use case diagram. And, you know, it's a visual summary of all these things we just learned, of several uh, related use cases, you know, all put together. And there's a thing they talk about, the first thing you need to do is to kind of draw the boundary of the system. And once again, this is remarkably similar uh, to that data flow diagram we started with where the entire system is defined by that first contextual blob in the middle. Uh, same concept, it's where I draw a rectangle around it and say, this is what I'm doing. Everything outside of that is external. And typically there'd be nothing outside that except actors. Okay, so if you look at that little goofy diagram, uh, they show exactly that. They show actors on the outside, a little diagram, and then a series of little ovals that talk to each other and perhaps talk back and forth between the actors. So that boundary, uh, the system boundary, is what's included in the system that you're developing. Um, and then, so that's the use case. It's designed to show basically external things. Use case typically talks about all the external interfaces uh, to the system that you're building. Uh, you know, so if you're building a system for a library, you'd have a use case for customers coming up and doing things, that kind of stuff. Uh, later on, on page 238 and beyond, they talk about the class diagrams. And the class diagrams basically show the object classes and their relationship and hopefully these things directly match the use case, right? Uh, each class appears as a rectangle and typically divided up in sections which show the attributes and the methods. Um, there'll be lines drawn perhaps between them to showing, uh, just like we have here, showing whether or not there's a relationship or these other types of things that's going on. And then of course they talk about cardinality. And, and once again, uh, man, the people have come up with these terms. Dang. Oh, so cardinality is more like a database term. And uh, it's best described if we actually show one. So here we go. A manager, one manager, can manage multiple representatives. Uh, in theory, you'd have at least one, but they show zero dot dot asterisk, which means zero or many. So one manager... Um, manages zero or many employees. Employees are assigned to a manager. Okay. Um, a sales rep is assigned to customers. In other words, a sales rep is given a list of customers and it, I guess it's possible that you would have no uh, customers given to a sales rep, although I can't imagine why. A customer places an order. So one customer can place zero mini orders. But here's one that has a one. So an order must have at least one thing ordered. But it could have more. So an order includes one or more uh, items in the order. So that's what cardinality is all about. It could have a one-to-one -one relationship. For every sales manager, there's a sales office. For every sales office, there's a sales manager, a one-to-one. -one. It could be a one-to-many. A manager manages multiple, um, you know, employees. A many-to-one would be the reverse. You know, the sales rep, multiple sales reps. You know, that kind of thing. So that's cardinality. You know, in a, in a, in a nutshell. Okay. So these are class diagrams showing the, basically the the title of the class, uh, attributes and methods are typically uh, shown there. Okay, so we've done use case, we've done class, now we talk about the sequence diagram. And this is kind of the same thing as a use case, but it shows the use case over time. In other words, okay, using the goofy example of a library, uh, the guy shows up and, you know, he's got a stack of books he wants to return, and, uh, you know, you do this and you do this, you, it's a dynamic use of the case model. And... Uh, they, they talk about, you know, the classes, like would be the library front desk is a class, and then the customer is a class. And uh, they have these lifelines, so that uh, the customer object isn't there at all times. The customer object magically appears, does this thing, and then disappears. So we actually get to kill off the customer. Woohoo! Uh, so they have a lifeline, and lifeline has this little deadly X at the end. 
meaning I've, I've killed off that uh, that instance of the class. Uh, so it allows you to, to focus. They draw these little circles uh, around the lifeline, uh, focusing in on the interaction between the classes. Uh, this is sometimes very useful uh, if there's something that's very complex. Um, you know, again, just kind of depending on the complexity of the problem you're trying to solve, you might have to go this far into a UML diagram to be able to show this to the library tech and say, is this how it's done? And they go, yeah. Okay, because for the, what, fifth, sixth time, these goofy diagrams are not for you necessarily. They're really to help you communicate to others, to your to the client and to perhaps the database people or the programming people later on, but right, they're not really, really, really for you. Okay. So they show some diagrams uh, on the next page talking about a student, a manager, and a schedule, and a registration, and how these things all line up in a sequence diagram. And again, this is not a very complex one. In fact, this one's so incredibly intuitive that I probably you know, wouldn't use a sequence diagram for this. I would wait for something to be a little bit more complex to do that. Okay, the next one on 241 is called a state transition model. And straight transition model is kind of sort of like an order status. Let's say that I just, um, I ordered a computer from Dell and I want to check on the status. So I go to their website and it says, um, uh, you know, payment pending. And they're waiting for the credit card to go through. So the next thing I check, it says uh, order confirmed. I go, cool, okay, so it went through, everything's good. Um, the next one comes up and it says um, assembly. I go, oh, cool, it's on the assembly line. Cool. Uh, the next one comes up and says, um, uh, quality assurance. Okay, so my system is built and somebody's looking at it. That's cool. The next one says, uh, packing. Uh, okay, great, it's being packed. The next one says, you know, shipping. Woohoo! And the last one is, you know, shipment delivered. Yay, it's at the doorstep. So that's a state transition. A single order goes through several stages, you know, stage one, ba -boom, ba -boom, ba -boom, ba -boom, ba -boom. and so one way of doing an object uh, kind of analysis is using UML to create a state change analysis. Wherever the state of the object changes, you can diagram it out. So on two, page 241, they show an example, state transition object, how it transitions from one state to another, like Oklahoma to Mississippi. No, that's not what they're talking about. Just kidding. Uh, and so they have these little rounded triangles that talk about the different states. And so in order for it to get from, you know, packing to shipping, there probably is going to be like a forklift or a conveyor belt or something. Something has to happen. It just doesn't magically, you know, vanish and then reappear over here. It has to have something happen to it. It's probably going to be, you know, a, a part something that you're going to have to do you're going to, have to be aware of so if these things are well defined this would be a cool way to describe because you walk up to them and say well how does it get from here to here and they go oh well you know we push this little button over here and and uh you know this grappler comes out of the ceiling and grabs this thing and takes it over there and you go cool uh, but you know it provides you that framework that asks them you know how does it get from point a to point b okay uh, next one on um, page 242 is the activity diagram. And this is kind of sort of the same thing. You could, you could use uh, a state transition and an activity diagram, and they would almost be the same. Almost. It talks about, you know, step by step what has to happen. The example they talk about is like an ATM machine. You know, they put the, in, the, the card in. Is it the right card? Uh, they type the pin in. Is it the correct pin? Uh, you know, they want to withdraw some money. Uh, is it within the limit? Uh, do they have the authority? Do, is there enough you know, sufficient funds? Boom, 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 boom. All these activities. And then, if it's approved, you do this. If it's not approved, you do that. So again, uh, this is just another technique. So you go take it to the bank manager and say, this is how I think it works. Can you look at this and go over it and make sure this is exactly what how you want this thing to work? And again, the purpose of these diagrams is to help communicate to others. And the last one uh, on page uh, 242 and beyond is the business process modeling. 
And it's basically kind of get everything together. It represents the people, the events, and the interactions, and all those things. And uh, they use the same thing with the with the swim lanes, you know, where you can have multiple things going on simultaneously. Um, I rarely see these, but hey, they're pretty kind of cool. Okay. On page uh, 244, they talk about the case tools themselves, the tools that you can use to help do this. And, of course, the whole point of a case tool is to make it easy uh, and fast. And, uh, and you know, you put one of these things together in Visio as an example. And um, now you have a permanent record that you can pass around and other people can look at and go, yes, I agree or disagree. Or perhaps you can say, I think I've done this one time before. Let me go back to my old case studies. And yeah, here's a use case that's very similar. I'll just pick up from where on that one. I'll just tweak it a little bit. Oh, man, it saves you time like crazy. Uh, otherwise, I mean, you could do this on crayon, right? But you'd never be able to use it over again. So the case tools insert have some sort of consistency so that uh, everyone always produces the same symbols every single time. You can pass it around and everyone understands exactly how it works. Okay, they, they talk a little bit on that same page about organizing the, the, the model. And so the whole point is, um, you know, you've got this relationships, perhaps, you've got, you know, inheritance kind of things. And if you organize these things, these collection of models, uh, it could actually help you understand a little bit about the relationships. Um, so you should organize them so they can be kind of linked together. That's the whole point of this little paragraph is, uh, Organize your case studies, so your use cases and all these things, so they can all be linked together. And the whole idea is that it's much easier to deal with it that way, because if you bust one of these uh, models, um, it's a little tough to go back and repair them if they're kind of all over the place. You know, if they're organized, you can go in and tweak things. And, because if I tweak a parent, uh, I immediately need to know uh, how that affects the children objects. Well, if I can't even find the children objects, uh, in my diagrams. I'll go in there and tweak it over here and go, oh, I got them all. Well, maybe I did, maybe I didn't, because they are not organized. Okay, so enough about that. Uh, the end of chapter summary on page uh, 245. Let's go through that. So, uh, object modeling is a popular technique that describes uh, the system in terms of objects. Yep. Object-oriented terms include classes, attributes, instances, messages, and methods. Object can send a message or commands that require other objects to perform methods or tasks. Yep, like put your foot on the brake, sends a message. Uh, the UML is a widely used uh, technique to, to visually document all these things. And there's a gazillion UML diagrams. The end of the object modeling process, uh, you can organize your use case and use these diagrams to create uh, you know, all these other things. So, use case describes a business situation indicated by an actor who interacts with the information system. Okay, that's pretty much well the end of this chapter, but before we end, I'm going to pop over to Visio and show you a few little tricks, and then we'll be done. So, let's get into good old Visio. And like I mentioned before, if you don't have Visio or you don't have this version of Visio, some of, them, some of this will be slightly different. Again, I'm in the software and database template categories. So now I say, well, here is a UML diagram. I double click that guy and now I have a template going. And here's an activity diagram, a collaboration, a component, deployment, a sequence, state chart, static. Da, da, da. Let's click on use case. And so now I got my little actor I can put out there. Woohoo! Uh, here's my little system boundary we talked about because remember everything inside here belongs to me. Um, you know, here's a, my use case. I can throw a couple of use cases in here. Uh, I can say that these guys, um, you know, talk to each other. Uh, but even with that, let's just, you know, again, Visio isn't just about uh, um, drawing pretty pictures. You're supposed to be going down here and actually putting some, some attributes in. So, for example, if I go here to property and I start putting in more and more and more of this information, you know, attributes and operators constraints. Um, does this look kind of familiar to you guys? Like maybe the uh, data dictionary? Yeah. Okay, that's as much as I wanted to get to. We're at the 15 minute mark, so we'll see you again in a few.